is the Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is the Chris Abraham Show, Season 6, Episode 33. That's right, drei und <laughs> Anyway, um, is that right? I don't know. Dude, I don't know anything. I was just, uh, I love my favorite thing about the, I mean, I assume this is right with regards to anybody who likes talk shows from the, from the 80s and 90s. But my addiction is, uh, I'm addicted to Coast to Coast AM. But not really George Nori. Like, I listen to George Nori and Ian Punnett and, and George Knapp and George, all the other Georges. Um, overnight, you know, I'm, I sleep alone. So at around 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock, if I wake up, I say, Google, play 1190KEX. And Google plays 1190KEX, which I think is a Portland radio station. But they play Coast to Coast AM from 1 a.m. Eastern to 5 a.m. Eastern. And then immediately after, from 5 a.m. Eastern to, uh, I guess, till 8 or 9 o'clock. So I, uh, I get to listen a lot of, of every show. And uh, today, I finally, I bought a, an iPad mini version 4 with AT&T and 128 gigabytes of RAM cell and so forth. And I really haven't gotten to it. And one of the things I did, though, is that I got a copy of every single, every, every, every single uh, Art Bell who was a guy who was from Pahrump, Nevada, or lived in Pahrump, Nevada. And he was an eccentric guy, probably a genius, who, from when he was a very young child, was addicted to radios, ham radios, and radio. Um, and uh, from like the uh, from the 90s all the way through the early 2000s, he had an overnight radio show out of his house in Pahrump, Nevada. And he single-handedly did one, two, three, or four hours a night for well over a decade. And he started one of he he start before he did that he had a show that was about politics and talking heads and you know kind of like glenn beck kind of stuff but he got a lot of uh, autonomy and started just uh having a talk show where people would just call in and the topics would be whatever art bell was interested in so He's interested in like UFOs and paranormal and whatever, um, politics, survivalism, uh, new world order, uh, alien abduction, um, climate crisis, global warming. Like he was all over the place. And, and, um, he also never had anybody like guard his calls. And so people would call in. And it was pretty unfiltered, and it was pretty amazing. And because he was open to all kinds of things, he, uh, it's like, it's like, it's amazing. It's like amber. It's like, it's like, um, you know, fossils in amber. And whenever I feel like the world is going a little crazy, and when I start seeing the world is getting a little bit spun up, hi. And when I worry that the wheels are going to come off the wagon, all I need to do is take every single episode of the Art Bell Show, a.k.a. Coast to Coast AM, a.k.a. pre-George Nori stuff that I've collected, along with every single, I think, almost every single episode of 
of, uh, of all my favorite radio shows, including, uh, you know, Gunsmoke and, uh, and, uh, oh, completely forgetting it. Um, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and all these other stuff that I really love. So I realized that if I spend $10 a month and pay Apple for the ability to stream their music as opposed to Spotify, one of the secondary effects is that I can take the uh, 250 gigabytes of MP3s that I have on my desktop, and they will automatically be uh, clouded into Apple's system. And I can automatically, without having to sync them to my iPad, I have access to every single podcast from Art Bell, and I have yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and like it's going to be a, an entirely new awesomeness, especially since I have a cool enough headset that I can listen and use concurrently and smartly both my Samsung and my iPad mini concurrently. And it's actually making me want to save up enough money to buy a 256 gigabyte uh, iPad mini 6 and like, you know, really spend the money on getting a, a the latest version of the iPad mini that you can get. One with a brand new battery, you know, that has a little bit of oomph, a little bit more storage and really enjoying the fact that I can listen to all these historical things. And what that'll do is get me all hot and bothered to make sure I do have all the cool episodes. I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing if I can find all the cool episodes of, you know, Ian Punnett's episodes uh, on Coast to Coast, or I don't know. I I feel like George Norrie's episodes are pretty ephemeral. I'm not really d- that drawn to them. But like I said, these uh, hundreds of episodes, thousand episodes of uh, of Coast to Coast from, you know, 90... Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, et cetera, et cetera. They are really an amazing, they're amazing uh, fossils that remind me that uh, everything that's going on that's completely wigging all y'all out is just a complete replication of what was wigging people out in 1994. Like I'm listening to one today. And there's this guy in there, and he's saying the same things about about uh, Russia that we're saying about Russia now. Saying the same thing about uh, Clinton as uh, we're saying about as the cons- he's a conservative guy. He's saying the same thing about uh, Clintonistas and Hill Kill and the Clintons being a crime family and all this other stuff that. People in the conservative movement are still saying about Clintons now, of course, but they're also saying about Biden now, right? Because Biden is connected to Obama, and Obama is connected to the Democrats, and the Clinton Foundation and the Obama Foundation are connected to the New World Order, and blah de dee blah de dee blah de dee blah So it's highly amusing, and it's a wonderful reminder that even then since this is 1994 the episode i'm listening to this was the very beginning of the assault weapons ban so the same conversation in 1994 before most of all y'all were even born before 9 11 happened in 2001 september 11th 2001 people were talking about the un uh the un taking over America and Red Dawn and they're talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. But it's like the same kind of crazy stuff that you would have expected before, right? Like the same thing that happened in 1994 is the same thing that's happening now. The ATF and the and the United Nations and and instead of a civil war, people are talking about how there's no way that they can take over 200 million guns from 75 million Americans, 250 million guns from 75 million Americans, and that this will require that uh, the SEAL Team 6 of the SEALs have to be willing to sign a form that says they'd be willing to attack and kill and fire fire on people of their own their own country. 
and that this would require that the police and military are subsidized by uh, United Nations troops that will take the globalist globe order and they will therefore go from house to house and take the 250 million firearms from our 75 million cold dead fingers and they talk about you know living moving into the you know uh, collecting food and being preppers and this is even well before any of the um crazy tea party stuff so uh it's been going on and then even then the guy on the uh radio show i forgot his name was already talking about things that he was referring to this is 94 he was talking about stuff in the 70s talking about stuff in the 50s he was talking about stuff in the 30s talking about stuff in the 20s He was talking about different glass notes and he was talking about the art of war and how Rush is always pretending not to be an evil, nefarious empire, and it tries to play nice and draw us into a false sense of security, and we spend a lot of money on them, and we try to bring them into the fold, and our naivety, naivete, uh, gets us in trouble, and then we'll all become pinkos, and we'll all become dead, and we'll all become slaves. The only thing that wasn't included at all, because in 1994, China wasn't even a thing. It was a bunch of farmers, uh, provincial farmers, and he didn't mention China at all. I think he mentioned a little bit about, you know, how Vietnam and all this other stuff, like he was really caught in the 70s, really caught in the Cold War. He didn't trust at all the fact that the Soviet Union had actually collapsed and fallen apart and that they were, oh, they had become sort of an orthodox capitalist oligarchical situ situation it was too early for him to know that but same shit different different generation man like it really kind of brought me uh like it grounded me like it was so great to excavate and to see the same fear of climate change exactly the same thing they were like 1994, they were saying Al Gore is a climate extremist, completely crazy. He's even worse than, than uh, the degenerate, the degenerate uh, blowjob in chief uh, murderer, Bill Clinton and his murderous Arkansas crime family. I mean, it's delicious and delectable. And it reminds me that all of this is just storytelling, right? Like we, we I went to GW and studied, I first started political science, but I had uh, Robert Combs, Professor Dr. Robert Combs, who seduced me into the world of American literature through, believe it or not, uh, uh, American plays as literature, not even like stage plays, but he was so good. Robert Combs would invite us over to his house. Like I really had a college experience, finally got to kiss the face of Catherine Medlin and got to hang out with, with GW poets and write little newsletters for the English department and send letters to all the professors asking them for their top 10 literature of all time. And, and I got to be the guy who hosted, uh, what's his name? Um, he wrote The Breast. Oh, such an amazing writer. Oh, I forgot his name. Anyway, so... You know, I mean, political science and, and creative writing and American literature, uh, c'est le même chose. Uh, so it's extremely delightful and amusing to see uh, and to be reminded that either people are completely, I don't know, lost in their psychosis or people aren't as naive as they say and that this is, you know, a strongly agenda-driven attempt at, you know, maintain the push-pull of us versus them and and uh it, this is just an essential part of of uh bread and chocolate of uh of uh uh circus 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 so it's really great i would recommend if you have a service or a way of finding through some sort of napster type of thing if you can find all the if you if you're savvy enough to do a little bit of searching, I think it might be an archive.org or I don't know, but I have them all. And if you want to find them, 
I can find a way of throwing it onto a thumb drive. Just give me a terabyte thumb drive or a 500 gigabyte or 256 gigabyte thumb drive, and I'm sure I can do it, or we can find a way of sharing it online. I can I can have a FTP server, or I can put it onto some sort of uh, some sort of sharing server, and you can have it too. It's awesome, so good. Oh my god! So now I have access to all of it. So I don't even know if I'm going to ever listen to a new podcast ever again. I mean, if I have to choose between uh, listening to a latest episode of Alex Jones or listening to the beautiful, beautiful like call-ins and conversations and just amazing like diversity. The thing I love about Art Bell is there's such a diversity of crazy from chemtrails to, you know, uh, cryptozoology to uh, Palladian aliens to greys to to back masking to channeling to numerology to uh, the interview of 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 philosopher priests and people who um, do ex- who, uh, priests who exercise demons exorcise and exercise I guess I guess if you're a demon it takes a lot of exercise to be exorcised and just amazing conversations about the Mothman and uh I don't know the crazy Latin American uh goat pig or whatever it's called um and just everything right like like it's a world that on one week can be talking about the uh the moon landing is being a hoax and the next week talking about the idea of of exploring and visiting Mars or moving out of the world and going and or crazy things, wonderful things like like there already being a black secret, black budget, skunk works, a uh, military uh, applied space program where where uh, space cadets are already out in the world fighting and federating vis-a-vis Star Trek already and passionately in a world where we have incredible technologies that we've used through backward engineering of from 1948 Roswell technology or the relationship we have with the tall blondes or the or the reptilians or the uh Palladians or whatever, right? So, so cool. But what I really like is when they deal with current events because when you have an all-night radio show that has no rush and you have two, three, or four hours of going really deep into a conversation, you really get an incredible amount of fossil in that amber. You you end up finding an entire preserved uh, mastodon rather than just you know, a couple fragments from a bone, which is, you know, what you get when you don't have that kind of long format talk radio. So it's delicious, right? It's like, it's like, holy crap, like everybody's freaking out because the end is nigh and, and Alex Jones and everybody else, the left and the right, CNN, MSNBC, especially, you know, Morning Joe and Mika Brzezinski, and Joe Scarsborough, or whatever his name is, and, you know, as well as uh, Tim Poole and Everin, Alex Jones and Glenn Beck, who, who are all saying Nazi, 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 end of the world. 2024 election is the most important election in the history of the entire world. And just as important as the most important election in 1992 and uh, 1994, uh, 1996, and 1998, and 2000, and 2002, and all these other elections, both, uh, senatorial, gubernatorial, mayoral, uh, congressional, presidential, just same shit. It's the same thing. The left and right, the center, doesn't really matter. If you, uh, see how your crazy, hyper, fantastic, 
hyperfant fant brain as opposed to my aphant aphantasia brain can really like i'm pretty i'm pretty well inoculate inoculated and i even kind of get confused sometimes of the difference between what i you know i read i'll be honest with you i read kurt vonnegut and um i read neil stevenson and i read william gibson with as much belief in hunger as I listen to, you know, crazy coast to coast, right? Like I, I, I learned a long time ago when I was working at Miriam's Kitchen and also at GW, like ask Mark Harrison, uh, my best friend who probably exists. He always wondered why instead of going to the bar where I would guarantee have found a delicious, hungry, sexy uh, girlfriend who I had been courting all summer, why I always end up talking to crazy people on the street who tell me, hand to God, that they're Jesus Christ and they plan to fly an F-16 into wherever with whatever nuclear bombs to foment the end of days as a messianic second coming of Jesus Christ. Homeless guy and would tell me at Roy Rogers at two o'clock in the morning when I should be deeply in bed with a uh, a beautiful young co-ed. He didn't understand. And I got to tell you, I learned, and I wish I did this with my mom, that you have to really allow whoever tells you something and who really believes it, you have to always live in their reality. You can't fight them about it. I've been, I think that really listening to these coast to coast AM replays is going to remind me that like when you tell me something stupid, about what you think is going on in the world, whether you call Trump a literal Nazi, literally the most dangerous person, literally the biggest threat to democracy in the entire world ever. And I just see a bloviating dumb fuck who was uh, never, none of his anything was ever followed ever at all. Nobody did anything he said. He had, uh, he had rabble and he had roused, but he didn't have any purchase or traction. He was, and this time he's not going to do anything either. And this uh, existential dread and this fear and this, 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 I don't know, like, like whatever that crazy thing is that makes you guys love sports so much and literally want to kill and eat children over whether or not the Patriots or the or the frickin' eagles or whatever win this or that. Like, that feral, like, racism and passion and delusion and that commitment of time, energy, and, and feral hormones on stupid sport is exactly the same kind of harangue that you give to anything that you feel you care about this week as much as you do about the damn eagles or patriots or cowboys or whatever so oh you completely are being used and you can't help it and i can't help it i i i guess i am an edgelord because i should be more gentle with you because when i mock you to your face whether you're left or right and you get so angry at me that shouldn't make me giggle like a little girl it should make me want to let you know that you know like I should treat you with as much respect as I do one of the uh, homeless people who I meet who tell me about their lived reality. And even though it's not my lived reality, it seems pretty real to them. And if I were to, in any way, make it really obvious to them that I think that their lived reality is bonkers, they wouldn't really be very nice to me, and we wouldn't have a continued relationship. So... In the same way that I need to really Stanislavski method into a world where I make you feel safe in your beliefs like I've always done in the past, I, uh, I need to kind of work on that like, and just keep my two cents in, under my own hat. And I need to really kind of, I guess, go deep and anonymous and maybe kind of just limit my edge lordship in a place where I'm kind of more anonymous and only kind of behave that way with other fellow merry pranksters and not people who 
would literally kill or die based on something that really doesn't affect them in any way except for, you know, in a very real way, renting space in their poor little heads, right? So I don't mean that to sound condescending. I mean, I mean it to sound very generous because all y'all are really comfortable, like, icing me out based on my amusement in this place. And I don't think I ever really can let you know that talking about Dostoevsky and talking about current events, I feel like the both of them are very much just narratives that I find compelling and interesting. And, and I find lots and lots of people who are really excited to talk about them. So it gives me kind of a real excitement to talk about the book I've read, right? Um, if I found someone who cared as much about Wind Up Bird Chronicles or or Infinite Jest, as I do, maybe that would be more appealing to me. Maybe I should have gone for a master's or PhD in literature and continued the conversation in a benign way because nobody is challenged by postmodern, post-war literature. But if you turn it into the fragmentation grenades of current events, people really do. People really do care. People care a lot. So on that note, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to spend, I think, more time committed to the entire idea that, uh, that I need to inculcate and inoculate myself in the fact that, uh, that this crazy is no more crazy or less crazy than the crazy that happened with great passion and existential dread that happened, you know, in the uh, context of 1994 with regards to the uh, assault weapons ban, right? That was, that was a big deal, right? That was as scary to people as anything else, right? The assault weapons ban literally says that you as a gun owner and your Second Amendment rights were really being infringed from 1994 to 2004. For over a decade, it was illegal to buy and sell assault rifles and high-capacity magazines and high-capacity pistols and stuff. And there was a very generous grandfather clause that, not a Santa Claus, but a grandfather clause that allowed you to, uh, you know, keep what you owned. Good evening. Good. Happy, happy holidays. You guys enjoy. I'm just meandering around. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that must have felt like crazy making, right? You're a uh, right winger who uh, like really identify with your ability to enjoy your liberties being extremely unique to America, right? Like even in 1994, if his numbers are right, he was saying 75 million gun owners own 250 million guns. Like it's much higher now, but, uh, but like that was a threat to liberty in a very direct way, right? It was a gun ban and it was nationwide. And it said that you can own any AR-15 or AK-47 variant or any high capacity magazine gun like uh, HK MP5 or an Uzi or whatever you have that had high capacity that would include Glock 17, a Glock 19, all these things. I remember reading about it. Uh, people would buy and sell pre-1994 Glock 17 and Glock 19 magazines with capacities of 17 and 15 respectively. And you, you know, you would deal in pre-ban esoterica. You couldn't get any new ones, right? So what you did is before 1994 happened, you would buy as many, uh, they didn't have PMAGs, as many AK-47 30-round magazines and as many AR-15 30-round magazines and as many, uh, I guess, Sig Sauer uh, pistol magazines and as many 20-round uh, Ruger Mini-14 mags and as many Ruger 10, uh, 10 22 30-round, 20-round magazines as you could. And a lot of people would invest money in them because they knew that if they could grandfather them in, they would be able to sell pre-ban 
grandfathered uh, uh, guns and pre banned grandfathered high capacity magazines, they would be able to sell them at a premium because they wouldn't be available anymore. Uh, he was talking about things like they were going to even ban uh, bolt action rifles. And instead of, you know, calling them assault weapons, they were going to call them sniper rifles. So they're going to ban literally bolt action guns, which aren't semi automatic. In other words, you need to cycle around in using a bolt. Then you can fire once, and then you cycle out the bolt, and you need to cycle in manually another round out of either a stripper clip or uh, a box magazine or a, uh, a tube, uh, things like that. Pump shotguns could be called. They could be called street sweepers. Like There's any number of euphemisms that you can use to make any type of firearm sound more scary, and by calling a bolt-action rifle, a sniper rifle, is an excellent way. But it wasn't included. It was uh, assault weapons included, high-capacity pistols and high-capacity removable magazine box-fed, high-capacity firearms like AR-15s and Mini-14s and Mini-30s and uh, uh, submachine, semi-automatic submachine guns like, you know, the, I don't know, CZ Scorpion or whatever. So it was interesting. It hadn't even passed in this episode of Coast to Coast. So this is the kind of thing where you got to see kind of, and it was, it was a very powerful, very all-encompassing, very much not a constitutional decision. And in, in the wake of that ending in 2002, sorry, 2004, it was not renewed, unlike the Patriot Act. And not only that, but ever since, the entire world of uh, of gun control has collapsed, right? Like there's less fettered access to all kinds of guns, like literally uh, rifle caliber pistols and uh, any other weapons that look like shot off shotguns and uh, AR and AK pistols that look like SBRs, short barreled rifles and all these other loopholes that allow people to get uh, NFA Class Three firearms that you would need to get an ATF tax stamp to to own. Uh, people would just be able to buy them if they could be redefined as a pistol instead of a short barrel rifle, or you know, a uh, any other weapon as opposed to a shot off shotgun. And uh, and you know, like it used to be when I was a kid used to be challenging to get a concealed carry permit. Um, before I bought, got mine, uh, you had to prove to a uh, commandi, you had to prove to a sheriff that you deserve to have the concealed carry permit. Then it became a shall issue. Most states became shall issue, which is if you passed a background check, this the uh, sheriff had to issue you uh, within 90 days they couldn't find anything bad on you in 90 days they had to give you the concealed carry and now 27 if not 28 out of 50 states have uh what are called constitutional carry laws or permitless carry laws which is to say as long as you go to the gun store and buy a pistol or a pistol caliber carbine sorry a uh, a pistol a rifle you can even carry a an AK or AR pistol with rifle cartridges known as a pistol under your jacket without having any additional training or additional background checks or running through the you know like let's say let's say I moved to Jacksonville which I've been flirting with a little bit Jacksonville Florida uh Florida is now a constitutional carry state so I have what I have a Glock 19 a Glock 17 I have a, a C-Camp LWS-32. I've got a CAR CM9. I have a kel P-32. Um, all those pistols, even the big Glock 17, I could carry in my belt or on my ankle or in a, uh, my appendix or small on my back or in my backpack or in my Hill People gear kit bag or in my bum bag or 
in my side bag or in my duffel bag, or I could buy a fancy shoulder holster, a leather one like 70s cops used to wear. Then I can put my Glock, my Gen 1 Glock, 1989-88 era Gen 1 Glock 17 in there and pretend like I'm, I don't know, Joe Cop, Joe Detective. Only detectives wore that. So I could be Joe Detective with my Glock 19 underneath my arm in a sweet leather. And, and I wouldn't need any special, uh, I wouldn't need a recip reciproci reciprocal reciprocity concealed carry permit. I wouldn't need to go and take a class and then appeal to the Jacksonville uh, sheriff. All I need to do is put my guns in my trunk, drive down to Jacksonville, move into whatever apartment I get, and from then on I can carry whatever pistol I legally own every day if I want to in whatever I want. Even if I took the stripped AR-15 lower that I have that's completely just a blank piece of aluminum, aluminum, and I turn it into a an AR-15 or 300 blackout pistol with just a buffer tube and a short 7.5 inch barrel or 5 inch barrel. And if I want to put a, a shoulder strap and hang it down underneath my Filson boiled uh, wool hunting jacket and carry that all day long, how awkward I could because Florida and Texas and West Virginia and, and lots of other states, 27 states, Alaska, most of the Midwest, most of the uh, Southwest, most of the Southeast, um, most of the states east of uh, Washington and Oregon and California, they all have open, uh, they all have permitless carry, constitutional carry laws. You can just legally carry without any requirement for the state. All you need to do is legally own your pistol, and that just requires filling out a form or having your uh, pop-pop or your, or your dad or your granddad or your uncle or your friend sell you it, a uh, private sale or whatever, and then it's yours, and, you know, you go to town. It's yours. You, you can carry it like, like has never been allowed in the history of America. Like in 1980, the only place that that was allowed in America was uh, Vermont, I think. And um, now the Constitution, constitutional interpretation is getting more and more in service of the constitutional support of gun culture and the ability to have ownership and carrying and self-defense being a, a human right, an American right that is given by God and shall not be... Uh, put asunder by man or government instead of it being, you know, a quirky little thing that only hunters and survivalists and so forth do. And it's not the world anymore where a quirky person has a nightstand gun. A quirky person can have a gun on them all the time. And even further, people who really carry, carry everywhere and they generally ignore any single law or any single request that any place outside of some place that wands them with a uh, uh, with a uh, magnet, uh, they just carry and they say, no cop, no crime, right? I'd rather be hauled to jail for carrying in a public building than not have a gun because a storner told me that they don't like guns in their store. Um, it's pretty fascinating. I don't think anybody knows it. I think that the Democrats keep on threatening to take all guns, and there's never been more of a permissive culture. In fact, the latest thing is that those rifle caliber pistols were really sort of freaked the, eight, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearm people out. So they were trying to put the kibosh on them. And then they said, if your, if your firearm, your rifle caliber pistol, is too much like a, a short-barreled rifle, which requires a tax stamp and an official background check and a $250 or $225, $200 tax stamp to be used with kind of a lot of restrictions. You need to, like, there's a, like a checklist of 10 things. And if your gun breaks some of these, you need to take your, what was last week, a perfectly legal uh, rifle caliber pistol with a, with a brace that looks a lot like a, um, 
a buttstock, you need to, if you, if your gun doesn't follow these particular guidelines that like overnight people were felons, like on paper, and it was required that people who had non-compliant firearms needed to register for a tax stamp and be wrote up in order to comply with law. And 99.7% of all Americans who were out of compliance chose to not comply. And there was such a non-compliance that the ATF had it, had, ended up having to back off. And those guns are still legal with the, with the uh, butt stock that, you know, is called a, uh, a brace, pistol brace, and all these other things. The uh, ATF had to back off because otherwise they would have to uh, enforce the ruling. And if uh, 25 million people had rifle caliber pistols now with, with, with Magpul braces or whatever that made them look a lot like uh, SBRs that need a tax stamp, they would need to in order to sort of like copyright. If you say that you're going to have copyright in a photo, but you don't ever lift a finger to enforce that copyright, that copyright isn't supported. So you need to have the will to enforce your copyright. Well, if the ATF makes a, a ruling that it needs to get all of your details and your tax stamp money, and you need to comply, otherwise you are a felon, they needed to start handing out felonies. And because nobody complied, I think except 1,700 uh, pistols, I think 1,700 total pistols out of whatever, 25 million rifle caliber, pi caliber pistols with, uh, with uh, pistol braces slash SBR stocks. Um, there were so few that complied that the ATF uh, rolled it back. Because otherwise it would get very expensive, very dangerous, and it wasn't worth it. Um, and I think they assumed that there would be pretty easy compliance. But um, once you allow something, you can't you can't really end up unallowing it. Um, so anyway, I think that this is long enough. Uh, this is the Chris Abraham Show, season six, episode thirty-three. Thirty-three is a magic number. Thirty-three is a magic number. I'm really glad that my 33rd episode is dedicated to Art Bell, who died, I think, in 2012. I don't remember. Anyway, love you guys. Uh, hope you enjoy these things. Uh, my friend Emmy thinks that I'm crazy and that also I'm inauthentic because I always uh, sell this podcast as a comedy and I don't think anybody laughs. But uh, she also thinks I need to choose a topic, but I'd rather end the podcast and choose a topic. I'd rather end the podcast than have to interview people and schedule that. Like as it is now, I just wander around the neighborhood getting my 10,000 steps and uh, wearing a headset so people think that I'm on phone calls and just yammer at you and then run everything through a transcripting tool and then run everything through ChatGPT and run everything through the Adobe sound, AI sound cleaning tool and then run everything through Audacity and remove all the silences, trim silence, and then normalize and then put it through the compressor and then export to MP3 and then add everything to Anchor.fm, which is now Spotify podcast. And I'm going to add one more step, which is every episode from now on, I'm going to have the Dolly AI image generator uh, create a bespoke uh, Chris Abraham show custom art. Uh, hopefully I will be clever enough to have it, you know, put like the Chris Abraham show season six, episode 33, and then have there be some sort of topical kind of illustration. And then it already sends it out, I think is a square, but I will ask for a square image and then I will upload that. So I will join No Agenda Show in the fact that I will start to upload bespoke, unique uh, pieces of art for every episode from now on. And I hope you love it. 100% of it's going to be AI, though. And I'm going to accept weird, shitty, little, crappy, as bad and weird, like six finger per hand album art as humanly possible. Because I want to lean into the failure of this particular endeavor. Okay, well, I'm going to go back to Art Bell. 
and I love you guys, and I'll talk to you soon. Uh, aloha, mahalo, uh, talk to you later, and uh, be good. Happy holidays. I love you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time. Wow.